a member of the OGC architecture board. Who knows what the OGC stands for? Ooh. It's the Open Geospatial Consortium and they, they do all open standards. So we have these three aspects. We have open source, we have open standards, and we have open data. And I'm going to talk about open data later today. Uh, well, actually in half an hour after you finished. Uh, so this is now the pitch for open source software. So I'm trying to give you a perspective on open source geospatial. Something's wrong with the coloring, so um, this, should be, this should be orange. So we're colorblind on my slides, <laughs> this is okay. Um, and the agenda is that I first look into software development. We just forget about open, just look at well, how does software development work. Uh, then we have the think, uh, thinking about, about proprietary and about so open source. Then we talk about free software licensing, the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. And I will present OSGU Live, but I'll skip that one so that we make a few minutes good for the next presentation. So first thing, what is open source? Let's look at software development. How do you develop software? Typically, you have a problem. Again, this one shouldn't be black, it should be orange. And software development team solves the problem. This is how software is being developed. Very simple, very straightforward. So the primary motivation is to solve a problem. In the open source world, people say, I scratch an itch. I have something to do, so I just uh, make a solution to this problem. Now, it becomes open source development when you take the solution and publish the code on the internet. And if the code is any good, and there is more people out there who have the same problem, then something interesting happens. Because software users, they have new ideas. They develop new requirements, and they find bugs in the software which has been created, because software is always buggy. And so what they do is they improve the code and release a new version, and you get into this cycle. And this is a process that never ends. Or did you ever have software that was like working and didn't have one problem? <laughs> so this goes on. It never ends. Um, and that's obviously where the action is. This is where all the developers that you're going to meet in this conference are uh, working. And the same thing works in the proprietary production model. So you have a software development team, and that solves the problem. But you have a whole lot of stuff around it that, uh, well, we think you don't need it. Maybe you do. And the primary motivation is a different one. It's to make money, which is not a bad thing. Everybody needs to make money. But if it's the primary motivation, sometimes it may be maybe that you know, stuff doesn't get done because the idea is just to make money and not to solve the problem. So what happens here is uh, the primary task is to market differentiation. So you're not trying to be the, uh, solve the problem, but you're trying to be different to others and better than others. That's the primary task that you do. And the business model is to restrict the distribution channels. So when here we say that um, we want to go to the internet and just publish the code, there is no restriction. In this model here, you have a restriction. And this re restriction is the goal to sell licenses. So you come from the make money, motivation and you want to sell licenses. How do you sell licenses? For example, by restricting features and releasing them in the next version. So maybe there's something wrong with the software and you don't fix it right away because it will be a feature in the next version that you're going to sell. And when are you going to release the software? There's a process, you know, I have market analysis, people, beta testers and all this, this very complex long process and at one point, you want to launch the product. At what point do you launch the product? Again, when it's finished? No, probably not. Usually, you launch a product in a time scale that is uh, suitable for your selling, for your, for your marketing. So for games, they are all finished just before Christmas. Strange that all the developers work that, you know, <laughs> just before Christmas, all the games are done. And so GIS software will be finished for the next big fair. So the same happens nowadays with OSGEO. We have this live G DVD, and it's always just done before Phosphor G, obviously. So the point in time 
is not something that is evolutionary, you know, we have a new version, but it's fixed by interests that are not to solve the problem, but they are to make money. So you can ask questions. When is the software released? When is new functionality implemented? Who cares if something breaks? One argument about open source, against open source, which is sometimes used is, oh, I can't sue anybody if something goes wrong. Now I ask you, when did you sue Microsoft the last time that you had a blue screen on your Microsoft <laughs> machine? So, so typically that's not a good argument. Um, and how many people actually developed the software? So uh, Oracle has, I think, more than 100,000 employees nowadays. How many people do you think developed the Oracle software? It's probably not 100,000 people. I'd, I'd, I'd make a good guess it's about 100. So, uh, and then you have 500 who do the licensing manager. <laughs> so, so, and then you have many, many people who just sell boxes. And this, uh, this, this has changed over the past 10 years quite a bit because nowadays you don't need to sell boxes anymore because you can just click and download the stuff. So within the proprietary industry, there is a lot of changes going on and they have a really hard time to adapt. The bigger they are, the more problems they have to adapt to the new ways of doing open source. So what do the others do who don't develop software? They try to make you not get the software, bluntly said. You know, they have licenses and they tell you you're not allowed to copy it and you're not allowed to share it and you only have one seat so it's not two people who can work on the same software at the same time. So, and the other thing is, where, where have the developers gone? Uh, this is it, not blue, it's magenta, but <laughs> the, the colors are all wrong. So where have the, the de developers gone? They have signed a non-disclosure agreement and they're not allowed to talk to the rest of the world and they sit in a black box in a little locked up room and that's where they develop the software. What do you think? Is this going to be good software? If they're locked up and all the rest of the world is having a party and making good code? And they're, locked up. <laughs> and they're locked up in a little room and don't know what's going on out there. So software developers have a hard time developing software in proprietary environments because they're not allowed to go on the internet and just download this open source stuff, which is so great. OK, so this is a bit strange. And uh, to better understand this, we uh, have to be more transparent. So making transparent usually says, uh, makes things easier. Let's look at the open source paradigm. So this is the theory behind the whole thing. And the primary motivation, we already had this, it's solve the problem and then publish the source code, let everybody use it and help them to copy it. Well, wait a second, what, what do you mean help them to copy it? Why would I help somebody to copy my software? which I have implemented, which is my ownership. It must be crazy. How do you make money? These are all questions like, uh, that you get asked when you do open source software. So we looked into this and, uh, and I, I, for the past 10 years, I didn't do a good job about talking this. So I read this blog by Tim O'Reilly and he says, I always pretty, I'm always uh, pretty good at finding the sweet spot where idealism and business reality meet. But I didn't spend enough time teaching that skill to everyone on my team. This is from his blog, Where I Failed, How I Failed. So I'm trying to uh, make, make a point in, in trying to, to let you know why it is actually important to make money. And now I will have to try to go online. So this is what we have just seen. There's interaction with users and there's, we improve software and then we iterate this thing and, and go into this process. And where do we make money? By providing support. So whenever somebody does something for you, like I spent an hour giving you support on the telephone, trying to help you to understand how this works. I'm spending time for you, so you're going to pay me. Very simple. It's a very straightforward business model. Training, you can come to my place, I tell you how to do it. I spend time for you, you pay me. Very simple. Consulting, you don't know how to set up the system, you don't have time to actually set up the system yourself, or you don't know the technical details. You get somebody into your house, and if somebody comes to your house 
and spends there a day, they have to pay their rent, so you pay them. Another business model. You maintain a distribution. Maybe you have a specific stack of software that you want to use in 1,500 different municipalities. They all want to use the same software because they have the same problem, but they need a copy of the software. So what you do is you create a distribution and then maintain it. And somebody is going to pay you for doing this. Uh, you do bug fixing. If something goes wrong and you fix it, somebody can pay it for you. You can do implementation, like install this uh, on, your, on your cluster in your, in your premises and uh, fix the, the firewall so that the data can actually get through and so on. You can get service level agreements. So you can say, if something goes wrong, I will answer within four hours. I will answer within 24 hours. I will answer within whatever time is defined. And depending on how quick you answer, you can scale up or down the price of what you pay for this service level agreement. And you can have maintenance so that after a year, you just get all the newest software installed. Or whenever there is a security patch, your service provider is going to call you up and say, hey, we have a security patch. It's not public yet. And we're going to install it on your system before it goes public. So all these kinds of things, that's all business models behind open source. So what's special about this? There are no monopolies. This should be red, it's not black. <laughs> so there's no monopolies because it's open source code and everybody can use it and every can, everybody can provide these services. So this thing is highly competitive. It's actually capitalism in its purest form. Whether this is good, I'm not sure because I'm not a capitalist, but that's it. So it's way far away from anything socialist, what you think, oh yeah, they're sharing software, everybody's happy and la la la. No way. This is hard business and it works. It works really good, as you can see in this conference. Okay, let's lean back. Why is then there so much fuss going on about license selling? And less than 10% of revenue in IT is generated through selling software usage licenses. But why do we think that open source is making everybody so much cheaper, everything so much cheaper, if it's just 10%. And in Asia, it's even only 2%, because a DVD with Autodesk just costs $2. <laughs> you can buy it at the street corner. So these 10% is in our area here. And all the rest is support, maintenance, service level agreement, training, consulting, and implementation, and all this other stuff. So. Why, why is there so much talking about licenses? Obviously, because it's the only thing that scales. So if Microsoft <laughs> sells one of the operating systems and they sell you the license, they don't have to do anything for selling you the license. It's like printing money. So the license business model is one of the best ones you can get because you don't have to work for it, which is cool. I would like to have that. So. Um, and this is why we hear so much. They are, we had six billions of loss in China for not selling proprietary license. This is crap. Because they, they didn't sell any of the licenses. They were just copied, so they didn't lose anything. They just didn't make the money, which is a different thing. <laughs> you know? So I lost six billion, of, six billion dollars because uh, I will have to take a little more time. So we'll just no, go. Just yeah, yeah. Um, so let's switch to the legal aspects of open source. And that's free software licensing. So there is free software and there is open source. Do you know the difference? Then we can just skip this. There was a big war between free software and open source because the open source guys said we have to do business and the free software guys said, yeah, but we have to hold high the idealism that is involved with doing open source software. Nobody talks about this anymore. But what is left is different tastes of software licenses. And one of them is this one, where you are use, uh, you're allowed to use it anywhere for any purpose. You're allowed to understand it. You're allowed to adjust it to your needs. You can collaborate with anybody else. And this is not as in free beer, but as in free speech. You know this free beer is always tomorrow. You go there tomorrow, it's again tomorrow. So. Um, with proprietary licenses, it's a bit different because you're not allowed to copy and you're not allowed to modify. You're not allowed to give away. You're not allowed to improve. You're not allowed to install, not allowed to share, not allowed. 
So if you look those licenses, you, you read those licenses closely, just take one of those licenses and read through them. Did you ever do that? <laughs> TLDR, too long, didn't read. Yeah. It's the same thing when you go and uh, sign up for Facebook or for Google Plus and they just changed, was it Google? I think they changed the privacy data statement. I read through it and this is when I got all this gray hair here. <laughs> <laughs> So let's 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 see this one. This is going to be fun in black and white. Sorry, there is no sound. Okay, they bricked it. This was 60 seconds and it explained everything so much better than I will ever be able to do. This is why I switched this one in. Um, so uh, in free software licensing, you always have a guarantee this is going to stay that way. If you look into the software uh, licenses, terms of uh, services and user agreements and whatever, it always says, oh yeah, come here and check back every now and then because we're gonna change them whenever we want to change them. And this is not going to happen with open source software. So open source software is actually licensed more clearly and better than any proprietary software will ever be able to do. Because a proprietary software license is owned by whoever owns that. Uh, so if somebody buys somebody else, they can just change everything. And this happens all the time. And it can even happen to open source software, like with MySQL, when it was bought by Oracle because the MySQL code was owned by a company and they had an open source license on it, but they also had some branding rights and things like that. So Oracle bought MySQL and suddenly MySQL was uh, in trouble. Same thing happened with OpenOffice. You heard about OpenOffice and it led to a, a, a fork between OpenOffice and LibreOffice. So there's two OpenOffice suites out there now. So things become complicated after some time when you go into more detail. We're running out of time, so I'm going to skip on this one. Just one little thing. Whenever you hear somebody say commercial software, say, oh, stop, that's wrong, that's not right. Because commercial software is a misnomer. What is commercial software? I'm using MapServer in a commercial environment. It's open source, I'm making money with it, and people are using it in a commercial environment. It's commercial software. So the word commercial software doesn't mean anything. The real differentiation is proprietary software and open source software or free software. That's the two different things. So proprietary software is the right term, but the proprietary folks don't like that term because it sounds a little, ah, proprietary is not a nice <laughs> word, so. Okay, open source software development. We know it's the superior development model and all the big businesses, including IBM, Autodesk, Oracle, Esri, and Microsoft, support open source and say it's a cool thing. So uh, if they say it's a good thing and they have a vital interest in not having open source because they're living off selling licenses, open source must actually really be a good thing. But anybody can call anything open source. So how are you going to know that the software you want to use is actually good software? And this is where the Open Source Geospatial Foundation comes into play. And that's the host of this, of this conference, the OSGEO. 
and they organize IT. It's a nonprofit organization founded in 2006, leading voice for geospatial open source. We have some similarities with Apache. We are volunteer based and sponsorship funded. And our mission is to support and promote the highest quality open source geospatial software. What do we do? We provide legal infrastructure, financial infrastructure, and promote free and open source software. And we help to have one of these conferences every year somewhere in the world. How does it work? OSGEO has a very complex structure. There is 181 charter members. They own the organization. And there is a big uh, membership. And this membership is organized in local chapters. Currently, we have over 40 local chapters in Germany and Italy and Africa and Denmark almost and Netherlands and in the UK. The UK local chapter is very active. So if you're not, if you are from the UK, you haven't talked to them yet, just try them, ask them, go to them. They meet, they do good things, they organize conferences like this one. That's, that's where all the action goes on. Then we have uh, several committees and the committees have special, special tasks. There's a conference committee, obviously. There's also a committee that quality assures open source projects. It's the incubation process. Then we have uh, nine directors and the president. You've seen the president this morning, Jeff McKenna. And we have 25 officers that come from the foundation project. So there is some software projects which have applied to become part of OSGEO. And to become part of the OSGEO, you have to go through an incubation process. And this incubation process looks into the source code and checks whether the copyright is right. Who owns it? Is there a quality assurance process? Is the, are the people developing the software, are they from different organizations? Maybe ideally even from competing commercial entities so that you know it's not owned by one single organization or developed by one single guy and if he's run over, the software stops to exist. That's the bus factor. Get run over by a bus, project ends. So we try to get projects which have a bus factor more than higher than five. Means at least five software developers. So uh, one of the one of the riskiest things ever is this conference, because if something happens here, <laughs> all our quality assurance is going to you know. Okay, we do corporate licensing, ownership, development process, quality, documentation, tutorial support, community fun functioning. And if you want to know more, everything is on the web. Everything is transparent. You can follow every single thing and decision that we're doing. It's everything there. So this is the OSGEO Live DVD. There are several presentations here about this DVD. And you can see that some of them are yellow. They are enterprise ready. They have gone through incubation. The other ones are in incubation or they're just associated software projects. They're good, we like them, they're on, on the DVD. But we cannot really say whether it's completely the correct way of doing things because these ones have actually gone through our process and have approval that this is an OSGO project. Funding, sponsors, big thanks to all our sponsors, which I should have here. That's Ordnance Survey, Aston Technology, GeoCut, First Base Solution, Lizard Tech, Second Quarter, Cartaquesus, Borealis, IGN, and Camp to Camp. Thanks a lot for helping us out. And most importantly, OSGEO works because you participate in the IT process. And this means you use the software, and then you learn about the software, and eventually, after half a year or a year, you are able to answer a question on the mailing list. And that's the point when you actually become part of the process. And it feels great. But you're not the stupid newbie and you know, <laughs> don't have to ask these stupid questions. But at one point, you can help somebody else. And this is, this is how it all works. So get into the process. Talk to the local chapter in, in the UK. Download the software. Get used to it. Learn it. Go onto mailing lists. Maybe if you're a software hacker, try to extend something, write the documentation, make some port, and that's how you become part of the community. And open source is a safe IT investment. I cannot stress this fact more. This is an investment that actually makes sense because it's not devalued. Whatever you invest into open source, 
you're not going to stop being able to use it after a year because your license has run out. You can use it as long as you want. And I have customers who switched in 2003 together with me from a proprietary system to an open source system, and they're still using the installation that I have put on their machines. It's still running today. It's amazing, but that software is 10 years old. It's a map server. I don't even remember the number, uh, and it still runs. It's incredible. It's really stable. It works really nicely. OK, thanks for your attention, and thanks for running over and uh, overrunning. And this is the next place. It's in Portland. So please book your flight now. We're in one year going to meet again in Portland. Thanks.